Our name is City Church. We want to be a church that's for our city and a part of our city. And so you can give through our City Church app. So any uh, app store, just search City Church Canada, and there's a really easy give button on there. Or there's a give button right here on the, um, this platform that you're watching the service on today. You can go to citychurch.ca slash give, or you can do an e-transfer, interact, by going to uh, the email giving at citychurch.ca. And the, the word that we're using there is Montreal, all lowercase. And so we are so thankful for you, and we so appreciate your generosity during this time. I'm so excited that we're continuing our series called Bystander this week, and I'm really looking forward to hear what Pastor Chris has got to say to us today. As a child, I have to admit, I was completely blind, completely ignorant to what went into making a meal and particularly cleaning up after a meal. Now that I, cont I continue to consider myself a, a child at heart at least, however, I'm a husband, I'm a father of two boys, I'm not, no longer ignorant, but I suffer from another kind of blindness. Maybe you can relate to this, husbands, that... And my wife is in the room because of this social distancing, babe. I've got to admit, I've got a confession today. I've got to get off my heart. Sometimes I intentionally am blind to the dishes that are piling up or intentionally blind to what goes into making a meal. And I've got to confess that. It's no longer out of ignorance. It's a, a willful blindness. It's amazing and so devastating thinking about this pandemic, how quickly it has changed my life in your life. It's amazing how it went from being their problem to being our problem. And every day is up and down. Every day there's fear. Every day there's new questions. It went from being simply annoying for us to adjust our lifestyle to now being so critical and so serious that dozens of people in Montreal, in our neighborhood, are dying because of the serious threat from COVID-19. And I believe that what it's done for me, and I'm sure the same is for you, is that it's brought to the surface the questions and the things that are the most important in life. I'm sure if you're like me and you, you are married or you have a family, you've held them a little bit closer and you've treasured those relationships a little bit tighter. I'm sure that you're not taking your health for granted anymore. And I think another question that's risen to the surface as I've talked to people in the last few weeks, I've seen the question about God and faith and particularly about Jesus be an especially important question. So today, no matter where you are on the spectrum of faith or investigating Jesus or just wanting to be encouraged today, we're so glad that you've tuned in with us because we are all truly in this together. Today, we're going to ask and answer this question. It's what kind of blindness do you struggle with today? Is it, a, is it a blindness based out of ignorance when it comes to your faith and the person of Jesus? Or is it an intentional, a willful blindness? Not wanting to look at the evidence, not wanting to consider the uniqueness of Jesus. What we're going to be doing today is continuing our series called Bystander. And for the last six weeks, we've been in the Gospel of John. John was a bystander. He was an eyewitness of Jesus' teachings, his greatest miracles, his crucifixion, and in fact, his resurrection. He actually ate with him after the resurrection. And so after many years, John, near the end of his life, he thought about everything Jesus said. He thought about all the great works that he did. And he put together this gospel account, this story, this good news account for all of us to prove that Jesus wasn't just a rabbi. He wasn't just a teacher. He wasn't just a prophet, but that he claimed to be God. And we're going to see in this next verse in John chapter 10 that the works of God, the signs, the seven signs that John pointed to helped us to understand that Jesus was unique. He was far above any other person who has ever lived. He said things about himself, and he did things that no one else has ever done. And today, we're going to be turning to one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, and I hope that that passion will excite you and will connect you. Again, if you're a skeptic, agnostic, atheist, maybe you've walked away from your faith, or today you just need some encouragement. This is what Jesus said in response to a question that the Jews of the first century, his peers asked him in John chapter 10, verse 24. 
the people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? What a great question. How long, Jesus, are you going to keep us wondering about your identity? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Just tell us if you're the Messiah. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and yet you don't believe me. The proof is this. The proof is in the work I do in my Father's name. You see, every week we've been looking at a different sign, a different evidence, a different, if you will, brick in the road that authenticates that Jesus was who he said he was and could only do what he did because he truly was the Son of God. So in the story we're going to be looking at today, it's Jesus and Lazarus. Jesus and Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and a whole village get caught up into this incredible sign, this miracle that takes place. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick and almost about to die. And he had the opportunity to go to that village and to heal him radically. But instead, Jesus intentionally held back. And just like last week with the man born blind, we're not sure exactly why, but we find out in the story why it is that Jesus delayed. He actually allowed Lazarus to die. We'll pick up the story in John chapter 11. He told them plainly. He's talking to his disciples. The disciples are saying, why aren't we going? Why aren't we doing anything? He said, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. Why? Here's why. For now, you will really believe. You will really believe now. Come, let's go see him. Jesus had a plan all along. He and the Father were in one accord. They, they, they had conspired together to do this, the greatest sign that they'd ever done together. The greatest sign that Jesus had ever done, certainly. But there was an intentional purpose behind why they didn't do it until this moment. It continues on. And Jesus has this interaction with Mary and Martha. And Jesus has another I am statement. Now, if you're a Jewish believer today, you'll understand and remember that your ears will perk up because the I am was reserved for the holy name of God. Only God can use that name. And yet repeatedly in the story, Jesus has used that title for himself. He said, I'm the bread of life. He said, I'm the light of the world. And today he says this, I am, see that? I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. John eleven twenty five. 25. What a promise. He continues though. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. And then he asks a really pointed and a very personal question. Do you believe this, Martha? See, Jesus just made an incredibly shocking, provocative, and powerful statement. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, which is to say that anyone who believes in me that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. Anyone who places their confidence in me will have life after death in me. But notice, it's not just about eternity. He says, I am the life also, which means that you get the relationship with Jesus today in your living room. You get the relationship with Jesus in the crisis, in the uncertainty, in the fear. Jesus walks through us in the storms of life, and he promises to be with us now and into eternity. What a great, great promise. A couple of moments later, Jesus is confronted with the death of his good friend, his close personal friend, Lazarus. He goes to the tomb, and this next verse might shock you. It might surprise you. And as a pastor, one of the greatest privileges I get is to preside at funerals. And every funeral that I have the opportunity to be trusted during this incredibly personal time and grieving time, I always mention this short verse in the Bible. As a child, I have to be honest with you, I kind of use this at, to get out of memorizing larger Bible passages because it's an easy one to remember. But as I've gotten older, and as I've gone through crises in my marriage or crisis in my life or going through a crisis like this, these two words have changed my perception about God and my confidence in God forever. This is what it says. He gets to the tomb. Then 
Jesus wept. During the coronavirus, Jesus is weeping. As husbands are saying goodbye to wives, Jesus is weeping. As we say goodbye to grandparents, Jesus is weeping. As we are struggling at night and we are filled with fear and we can't sleep because of the tears on our pillow, Jesus himself is entering into our suffering and into our grief. He is there. He's comforting. He's compassionate. He's not a distant God. He's a God who very much enters into our suffering, into our way of life, into our thoughts and our deepest fears. A couple of months ago, I was at another funeral, and this time it was for a family member. My grandmother passed away at 99 years old in Ottawa. And I have got so many happy memories. And I thought, because she'd been suffering and been getting older and older, we knew that it was coming any day now. And yet there's such profound sadness. It doesn't matter if you're nine days old or 99 years old. There's something about death that robs us. There's something about death that none of us should be okay with. And that's why Jesus wept. It was never part of God's plan for death to be experienced by any of us. It was the result and the consequence of sin. And after the, the funeral service, we went to the graveside and we buried my grandmother. We saw her headstone. And I picked up the, the grass, the, the false grass that was around that area, and I, I pulled it up and I found the graveside of my father who had passed away back in 2010. So my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father were buried almost right beside each other. And in that moment, it reminded me that that's the fate that I will have one day. It hit me for the first time in that way, that serious of a way that that's my fate. It's the fate of everyone in this world. Now, many of us, of course, we're going to be okay. We're going to survive and thrive well after the coronavirus comes and goes. Some, of course, we will grieve with and we will carry through them together. But for all of us, at some point, all of us will close our eyes for the last time. Our heart will beat for the last time. And this, this passage is incredibly relevant because there is a virus. It's a virus called sin that everyone in the world will contract. And the word of God and Jesus himself said that sin has separated us from him. It will lead to physical death and separation from God unless we receive the gift that Jesus gave us. Well, let's get back to the story. Let's find out what Jesus did through this incredibly sad time of seeing the tomb, the death of his friend Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 41, Jesus commands them to roll the stone away, so they do. And then Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, Look, listen to this, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here. Here's the reason. So that, purpose, so that they will what? Believe. So that they will believe that you sent me. The reason why Jesus hung back and didn't immediately go rush to Lazarus' side, the reason why the Father and the Son conspired together to do this great sign was because of those early first followers of Jesus. It was for everyone paying attention in that small village. It was for the sisters of Lazarus. Martha and Mary. It was for John. So that everyone will believe. It continues on. This is what Jesus does. He shouts. I love that. He shouts loud so everybody can hear. There's no mystery behind what Jesus is going to say. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and his feet were bound in grave clothes. His face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him. Look at that. And what? Let him go. Death grips all of us. It's a reality that every family has to deal with. It's a reality that every one of us has to deal with. But I love this sign. This miracle says, let him go, which means Jesus has freed us from death itself. Again, we can have life today with God and through Jesus, and we can have life forever with him. There's no separation through death. We get continue that relationship. I love that image of letting us go, something that holds on to all of us like a death grip. Jesus releases through his power. 
Here's the result of this incredible sign, this incredible miracle. Many of the people who were with Mary, look at that, believed. They believed in Jesus when they what? They saw this happen. Again, as we've been saying week after week, we have not asked anyone to take a blind leap of faith. Leap of faith. It has always been based upon what they saw, what they heard, what they smelled, what they experienced. They saw and then they believed. That's why John recorded this good news. That's why John recorded this story so that they would see and they too would believe. But notice this, not everybody believed. You have to wonder why. Well, verse 47 some messengers, some people who were eyewitnesses of that very miracle ran into Jerusalem and they told the Pharisees and called the high council together. You might get a, a kick out of this. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. That was not disputed. The Jews and the elite, the leaders of the day, understood and authenticated that Jesus was doing things that nobody else had ever, ever, ever been able to do in the nation of Israel. I love this. If, if we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will what? Believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Why would some see the sign and see the evidence and believe in Jesus and others would take that same sign, that same evidence, and decide to look the other way. As I was thinking about that, I came across a story of Dr. Francis Collins. And in the early 2000s, he was the leader of the Human Genome Project, which mapped the entire DNA of the human body. It was a massive achievement. He was appointed by President Clinton and then served under President Obama and President Trump today as the National Institute of Health an incredible scholar, and a brilliant mind. And he's also a follower of Jesus. But he didn't start that way. In fact, his parents never raised him in church. In fact, were very skeptical about church. But later on in life, as he went through degree after degree and PhD after PhD, there was an old lady as he was making rounds as a physician. And she was near the end of her life, and she was suffering terribly. And in the course of their relationship that was being built, she asked him the question, what do you believe, Dr. Collins? And this brilliant scholar, this brilliant mind, was stunned. He was stunned because he realized that he didn't have a good answer. He wrote a book called The Language of God. As he talked about the, the mapping of the Human Genome Project and all of his, his research and all of his studies about science and how faith can coalesce together, and this is what he writes in this book about the process of him going from an atheist to becoming a follower of Jesus. He says this. After this interaction with this grandmother who was suffering from cancer, was in incredible suffering, he said this. And yet, here I found myself with a combination of willful blindness and something that could only properly be described as arrogance having avoided any serious consideration that God might be a real possibility. Incredibly honest and candid words from a brilliant atheist who when he looked at the evidence, he looked at another atheist named C.S. Lewis who also became a follower of Jesus because he understood that it wasn't about the data, it was actually about willful blindness. Again, what is, what is it that you st struggle with today? Is it, is it ignorance or is it intentional blindness? Jesus has claimed to be the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the whole world. He claimed to be the Son of God, and he did works that only the Son of God could ever do. What have you done with this Jesus? I want to end with that question. Have you pushed him to the side? Have you looked the other way? Or are you leaning in right now because you understand that maybe this Jesus has something to offer you that you've never considered before? Again, is it ignorance or is it intentional? Is it, is it out of ignorance or is it intentional? Well, let's go back to what Jesus said. And, and I believe that we can't make sense of the claims of Jesus and the, 
the New Testament in general if we don't put ourselves into the story. So I've written a paraphrase. And so don't send me any emails today. Know that this is a paraphrase of what Jesus said. But I, what I did is I replaced Martha's name with your name. And I believe this is what Jesus wants to say to you today as you're watching, as we're getting ready to close this talk today. It's, it's this. Jesus tells you. He tells me. He tells us. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Now, here's where I want to get really personal. Do you believe this blank? Do you believe this, Chris? Do you believe this, Divin? Do you believe this, Tammy? Mark, do you believe this? Jesus claimed to give us life together with him right now in the fear, in the uncertainty, in the incredibly difficult season of life that we're all living in. But he also said that I will be with you into eternity forever. A promise that no other prophet, no other religion has ever made. It's a certainty that you can have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God today and into eternity. And those of us who believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he did die for our sins, that he did rise again. Well, we have the promise that we'll be with him today, and as we close our eyes on this life, we will wake up in his arms in eternity. And at the same token, the promise works the other way. If we reject, if we are willfully blind to what Jesus said about life and about sin and about eternity, well then, if we reject Jesus in this side of eternity, we will also be apart from him on the other side of eternity. I urge you as we close today to make this decision. Don't put it off any longer. You've been putting it off for weeks. You've been putting it off for decades. You've met people of faith. You like people of faith, but for some reason you've always held back. Right now, even in this chat, there's an opportunity for you to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus today. And that slide's going to be on the chat right now. But I want to urge you with every fiber of my being. Again, just a couple of months ago, I buried my grandmother. And I saw the headstone of my father. And what gives me hope for my own life, for my children, for my wife, for my city, for my cities of the world? It's not a religion. It's not a hopeful thing. It's something that I believe that we have hard evidence about. That an eyewitness named John wrote down all the things that Jesus did, all the things that Jesus said about himself. And next week, we celebrate the resurrection, authenticating once and for all that Jesus doesn't have just victory over death, but victory for eternity also. So I'm speaking to you right now. Again, I urge you with every fiber of my being to make it personal, to take the opportunity to grab the hand of Jesus to give your life to him, to say, I believe. And I want to know that on the other side of eternity, I'll be with you. And I want to know for certain that you're going to come into my life right now. There's not going to be a break. There's not going to be any disconnection between this life and the life to come. If that's you, will you pray with me? Can I ask you just to close your eyes? Can I ask you wherever you are just to bow your heads and pray for all the hundreds of people that will be making that decision right now? Again, please, don't put it off. Make Jesus your Jesus. Make him your Savior and your Lord and your resurrection and your life right now. Let's do it. Father, right now, we thank you for the incredibly powerful promise that you gave to your son Jesus who said that he was the resurrection and he was the life, that anyone who believes in him will have life now and life for eternal with you. Father, we believe that Jesus died for us. We believe that on the third day, Jesus rose for us. And we believe that Jesus will receive us in heaven after we die. So Father, we, right now, we ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would come into our life, replace fear with power, re replace weakness with, with strength, God. Give us peace. Give us new wisdom. And give us the confidence that you will be with us now and forever. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Hey guys, if you made that decision, you made the greatest decision you will ever make. And we are so proud of you. Again, please let us know in the chat that you made that decision. And at the same time, I know there's a couple of people out there that say, I want to make that decision so bad, but I'm just, I, I got to take another step. I need more time to investigate. We respect that. We really do. If you can't make that decision today, please, however, go to mycitychurch.ca slash Jesus and investigate for yourself. Again, don't put it off. If the only barrier is more information or more time, then I'm going to count on you to make that investigation worthwhile. Take the time and let us know that you want information. I, we can call you. I can call you. We can send you things to read or things to listen to. Whatever your objection or problem is, we want to stand with you because we are for you.